For the past two months at Pivot 613, we've been talking about two cornerstone paradigm shifts. The first is that we are a no-fear zone characterized by our commitment to being a community identified by grace, mercy, and love. The inception of the Pivot 613 idea happened when we realized that we could no longer help facilitate and maintain an atmosphere of fear, judgment, and condemnation, and decided that once and for all, we wanted to be a part of a movement that embraced the heart of Christ, which we believe to be extravagant grace, mercy, and love. The second paradigm shift that we've just completed is the whole idea that we are a red pill church, absolutely awake and absolutely free because of what Christ has done. We're not creating a movement with a substitute set of controls claiming that what we offer is true freedom, when in fact all we're offering is an illusion and not the real thing. Instead, we will joyfully embrace Christ and the freedom that can only be found in him once and for all awake to the liberty that comes from being his children and aware of the possibilities that are opened up once we abandon fear and embrace love as we build the no fear zone. But like every lofty idea, there comes a time when you have to speak plainly about how these ideas actually play out and what things are going to look like under the hood of the movement that is Pivot 613. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to turn a corner and talk about eight pillars or distinctives that are going to help us build on the cornerstone paradigms of grace, mercy, and love. And these pillars are going to be the things that identify us and in many cases distinguish us from other faith movements around us. Today, let us speak for a few moments about the first four pillars, to live simply, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. These four distinctives came from three separate passages of scripture that we feel capture the practicalities of being a movement that takes Jesus seriously. They're both shocking in their imagery and forcefulness, and it is for this reason that we have to stop in our tracks and pay attention that we may not only distinguish ourselves by our obedience, but also by the timeless countercultural call that they represent. There is not enough time in this video for me to read them all, so I suggest that you read the following passages of the Bible once you are done watching this video to see how they all come together. The first passage is Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 10 to 20. The second uh, passage is Matthew chapter 25 from verse 31 to 46. And the third passage is Micah chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 8. Before I take the time to speak about each of these four pillars, I'd like to bring something interesting to your attention that we find in scripture about the first church that sprung up after Jesus had ascended to heaven. If we look at the parts of the Bible that, some of, that, that have some of the history of that early movement of Jesus' followers, we find a few short phrases that tell us about the kind of communities that this faith uh, movement was building and how they had these four tenets or pillars at their core. Here's what the writer of the book of Acts says. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need, who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, at Pivot 613, we're not going to eventually ask you to sell your homes and move to some commune of our choosing. Some people are not yet sure of us and think that we're some kind of cult, so asking you to do something like that would most definitely set off alarm bells for those of us that are familiar with cult movements all over the world. We will not ask you to leave your homes, but we will certainly talk about other practical ways to materialize these pillars in a way that makes sense for our 21st century context. So let's start by talking about living simply. Never in the history of man have we been more busy than we are right now. We're literally scheduled up to our necks, many of us barely treading the waters of our busy lives. We live in a kind of opulence that the world has never seen and we are so inoculated to our situation that we do not realize how cluttered our lives are. It's no wonder that people living in the same house choose to text or Facebook each other rather than have face-to-face -face conversations. It is no wonder we have shows like Hoarders. 
these are the logical extensions of living lives that are too complicated, overscheduled, overcrowded, and just frankly out of control. The unfortunate fact of this overscheduling and overcluttering of our lives is that we have created communities in which things are more important than people and processes are more important than individuals. Mental issues related to extreme isolation are at epidemic levels and people are the collateral in our race to ensure that nobody screws up our carefully crafted bubbles. At Pivot 613, we want to be intentional about challenging the people that are part of our movement to do the hard work of figuring out a simpler way to live. In fact, this is the reason why we've chosen to have a simpler service with fewer bells and whistles this week. Simpler lives free up more opportunities for God to speak to us and for God to use us. Simpler lives free up more of our time and more of our money. Simpler lives free us up to be used to love others and love God, serve others and serve God. Each one of us is a limited resource and so simpler lives enable us to maximize the awesome resource that we are in this world for God's glory. In addition, simpler lives free up the space that allows us to do a better job with the other pillars, justice, mercy, and humility. Listen to these words from the book of Micah's sixth chapter at the end of one of the passages of scripture that, va- that, that, that I've asked you to read. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. At Pivot 613, we're going to challenge each other, each other to act justly. If you are new to this Christianity thing or you've not read your Bible in a while, you may not know or remember that the so-called golden rule is actually a quote from the Bible in the sixth chapter of Luke, where Jesus is giving one of his teachings that I personally find particularly tough. In this chapter, he's challenging his followers and listeners to completely break the mold. This is the same passage of the Bible from which we get the whole notion of turning the other cheek. And it is a teaching that is still countercultural today. When we talk about the pillar of acting justly, what we're really saying is that we want to be serious about following Jesus' teaching in this instance. We want to love our neighbors as we would have them love us. We want to do unto them as we would have them do unto us. But we also want to take it a step further. Even when they may not love us back, we want to love even more. Even when they will not share with us, we will share with them. Even when they will not serve us, we will serve them. At Pivot 613, we're flipping the script, and we will not stop there. We will go an extra mile and initiate acts of love and service with those around us, meeting practical needs within our community and also in the world. I need to say this as plainly as I can. We want to be a church that is known for action in social justice situations. Pivot 613 is going to be a church that is elbow deep and knee deep in the service of those less privileged than ourselves. I can pretty much promise you this. One weekend, we will cancel a worship service and ask you all to go into Ottawa's inner city to join hands with an organization that's already there touching and changing lives. We're that serious about it. Now, the reason that we're flipping the script on justice is because we're called to be a people that love mercy as well. And this is our second pillar. Turning the other cheek requires mercy. Following Jesus' example with those that sought to destroy him requires mercy. Reaching out to spend time and money and touching the people that society conveniently forgets requires an attitude of mercy as well. But even with one another, we must be merciful. As I've said so many times in my messages to Pivot 613, we live in a society in which we are incredibly exacting in our standards with each other and with ourselves. There is literally no room in our overscheduled and lives and overcluttered lives for mistakes, and you can see it in the judgmental faces of people when your screw ups become public. Loving mercy will require us to walk a different road with each other and with ourselves. We're not proposing a church that is an immoral free for all. What we're proposing instead is that we build a community that understands that we all need more than three strikes. Making mercy a pillar is more than just talking about it. Loving mercy will have enormous practical implications when we finally start to grate on each other's nerves. It will be tested when we have our first big moral failure at Pivot 613. And we will need to love it as the church grows 
And as God brings into our community people that are broken and flawed and yet drawn to his presence in us. Being a community that lives simply, acts justly, and loves mercy requires an essential ingredient or else the whole thing is a house of cards. It requires humility and this is the fourth pillar. A contemporary view of humility suggests that it means having a modest or low view of one's importance or remembering one's place. Both of these views of humility are only partial and can be misleading. I would therefore propose that humility starts with an identity realignment. The things in which you have placed personal importance, the things uh, that you have hinged your identity and reputation on, are the things that have the ability to lure you into pride or show you the path to humility. The path to humility requires us to individually and corporately move the source of our identity from temporal things around us, our social status, our intellect, our financial status, our education, and place them in something of greater importance, which is our identity in Christ. It starts by becoming Christ-like, and like Paul says in his letter to the Romans, by a renewing of the mind. A mind renewal happens when you come in contact with a person that walked this earth and perfectly embodied humility in his heart and in his actions. And this person is Jesus Christ. Outside of him, any other kind of humility is a facade. So if you understand that who you are and what you are able to do is because you are first and foremost a child of the Most High God and he has called you his son or daughter... Everything else, in this, everything else in this life gets realigned around this concept because you realize that everything else is worthless and temporary. You are able to see your gifts and talents and position with the perspective that God created and gave them to you. And because they're powerless to lure you into pride, you're able to use them as God initially intended. And in the process, instead of bringing all the attention to you, you are able to bring praise and honor to him through their use. Your worth comes from him and it is completed by your faith in him. And so it is on this foundation that pivots at pivot 613, we will strive to remember our place in this world and in God's kingdom. We will always do our best. We will always try to remember that doing our best does not make us better. We will always consider others better than ourselves and we will always serve others gladly, regardless of their social and cultural uh, position. So there it is. We want to be a movement that embraces these pillars, not just as organizational driving philosophies, but as practical realities that we, that we all embody and that we challenge each other to live up to and allow Christ to reveal in us. At Pivot 613, we want to be a people that live simply, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. And in order that these principles become a reality, we must ask ourselves a couple of serious questions. Number one, what is one thing that you can do this week or this month to take a step towards living a simpler life? Number two, what are some practical steps that we can take to ensure that we are a movement that is proactive and not reactionary where social justice issues are concerned? Number three, if we're called to be a people uh, characterized by generous mercy, what are some of the things about our previous indoctrination that we have to shed in order to be a movement of agents of mercy? And here's the last question. As we stand firm in our place in God's kingdom, what things do we need to identify as, identify as lures that will keep us both individually and corporately from considering others better than ourselves? What are the traps in our path towards walking in humility?